Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. This is a wonderful building. Uh, there are a lot of people to thank for organizing all this, and I think we should all thank the person who allowed all this to happen. Uh, what's his name? Uh, 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 he was, he's from, from, from Seattle, and uh, he attended the University of Washington, I mean, for a while, because he quit. Then he went to Boston and convinced another guy to quit studying. <laughs> they made some money. Uh, eventually, he became a uh, philanthropist, but he realized the most important thing to study is the, is the brain. And this is how this institute called, uh, oh, they produced this uh, nice uh, atlas, or the Allen Atlas. So it's, thank you, this is Paul Allen. So my, the little trouble that I had with my memory here illustrates perfectly well what we do in order to retrieve something from the past or project to the future. What you do is you do a mental travel back in time. You can do shortcuts, you can do detours, but eventually, if you try, you get to the point. My message for today is that this algorithm that allows me to do this, this search engine that allows me to retrieve an item, is exactly the same that initially allowed animals with smaller brains to navigate in the environment and learn adjacent adjacency as well as shortcuts and detours in real, uh, real space. Now, this search engine, of course, is extremely useful. Uh, and, and my take home message is it, 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 it's, it's uh, a fundamental operating system hasn't changed much since the rodent when you go to up to the, to the human hippocampus. In order to understand how this search engine is working so rapidly, and typically it works just in a matter of tens of milliseconds, in fact about 100 milliseconds, which is one single theta cycle, uh, we have to know a few things. The first thing we have to know is what is the wiring diagram of the circuitry. Once we have the wiring diagram, then we would like to know how these components of the wiring diagram work together as a circuit. Now, if, unfortunately, we don't have that knowledge, so most of what I do is the same thing as uh, David Anderson said, is uh, uh, science fiction. So our science fiction starts here, trying to identify at least the connectivity. What you see here is a, is a relatively completely filled uh, CA3 region of the red hippocampus. All the axons that you see here is uh, is part of this one single neuron. It's quite remarkable. And uh, somebody already made this, this comment that you know, things are long and you can go to Tacoma. In fact, one axon of uh, the axon tree of, of all these CA3 pyramidal cells, eventually, if they are lined up, then we will go to Tacoma. Now, why do we need this extremely dense connectivity? In order to connect everybody, that is all the 200,000 CA3 pyramidal cells, all you would need is one is, should be connected to 16. Instead, one is connected to 20 to 50,000 potential targets. What does it buy you? What it buys you is, in contrast, when you had so many steps, so many connectivities, such as the situation probably in the C. elegans, you have to go through multiple neurons in order to get from anywhere to anywhere else. Because of this strong connectivity, you can surge this entire n-dimensional space in just two steps. And what it buys you, of course, is time, because you can do this search in just 100 milliseconds. Now, what do we know about the behavior of those neurons? What you see here is this, this, this LFP pattern recorded from the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And uh, this is the mass product of the brain. This is the pulsating activity of, of cooperative actions of many of, of those cells. But if you look at what one neuron does in the environment, then, then usually if you train the animal to run in, a, in an alternating uh, maze type such as this one, one neuron will fire here, another neuron will fire there, and the lots of neurons fire in various parts of the place. John O'Keefe, who discovered it in 1971, in fact, call these play cells. Now, these play cells are very useful and very exciting, but it 
does, they don't tell us at all how I could eventually find uh, Paul Allen's name in my brain. The way how we have conceived the, the workings of these pyramidal cells, the play cell, is that they are activated by external landmarks through various uh, uh, algorithms such as triangulations. So the reason why pyramidal cell one fires here and pyramidal cell two, pyramidal cell four and so on are firing sequentially one after the other is because the animal is moving around in the environment and in, as in counting different constellations of the environment. But that's not good enough for recalling memory or planning for the future. What we need is without any cue, I can just sit here and think about where I came from, where I was yesterday, and where I'm going tomorrow. We need a sequential activation of cell assemblies one after the other in such a way that whenever this is finishing, it gives this information to the next assembly and the next assembly and the next assembly. So this is good. We have two, potentially two ways to generate these patterns. And one way to confront or look at the relationship between these two different models is just imagine that you freeze the animal in space that is here and now and see what happens in the hippocampus. According to the spatial map theory, uh, let's say P3, and when animal is frozen in this particular part of the environment, this neuron should fire at the same firing rate forever as long as the animal is here as long as all the other brain dynamics are maintained. And this neuron should fire a little bit, but P5 should be completely silent. So the way how to do that in the laboratory is to train an animal to run in a wheel facing always the same direction and at relatively constant speed in a hippocampal dependence task, which is this. The animal has to go to the right, reward it. The next time it has to go to the left. It has to remember that I came from the right, now I have to go to the left, and so on. And in the meantime, you require the animal to run in this wheel. Now, when you do the experiment and you record from multiple neurons simultaneously, in this case 58, you will be surprised. What you see here now is this is not distance, this is time, and every line is a single neuron, and the color is the firing rate of that neuron, ordered in, the, in a sequential way during the travel. What you see is that the, the peak colors have pretty much the same duration. That is, the cell and its partners are active for about the same time, for about a second. And this is exactly the, the way how the animals, how, how these cells behave when the animal is moving in the environment. So there is this trajectory here, even though we did everything possible to keep the environment constant, as well as the idiothetic cues from the body completely constant. Yet, the, the, there is this pattern called trajectory in this n-dimensional space in the hippocampus that the packet of activity just goes on forever. If I could keep the animal running for a long, long, long time, as it's in this uh, simulation, then, then everybody in the hippocampus would fire at least once. Now, the good thing is that in this trajectory, there is some information. Because this task is hippocampus dependent, and the animal has to remember, oh, I came from the right, I have to go to the left. We can dig out that information. So let me just show you one neuron. So this, this is the, the task. The animal is wearing this uh, little LED. This is one neuron that fires, and let's see what happens. When the cell fired, the consequently 20 seconds later, the animal went to the left. Now the animal returns to the wheel, is running in the wheel. We don't see any firing. The animal goes to the right. Now it comes back, firing again. We had a, now we have a hypothesis from two trials. So then the hypothesis is sort of confirmed because the animal went to the left. Then the cell is not firing. Then we already make a prediction. Aha, uh -huh, we had a hypothesis, we confirmed it, we can publish a paper. <laughs> now the cell is firing, so it's uh, an extra trial, and you can see that what happens, the animal, of course, goes to the left. And now I'm asking those who are still active and awake, what should happen next? The cell is not firing. 
Yes, the allele has to go to the right. So now we observe the behavior, we make predictions from the behavior of the animal, or we go into the brain in the hippocampus and record from the number of cells, such as this neuron, which is not firing. So we say, the animal will go to the right, 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 until the cell starts firing. Now, the requirement here was just to run for 20 seconds. This animal is doing extra work, is running more than necessary, and now we have to ask ourselves, do we, behave, do we believe the behavior of the animal or do we believe this neuron? And according to the neuron, the animal has to go to the left rather than to the right, so this is exactly what happened. Now, this neuron is wonderful, but it's absolutely useless to guide behavior. Why? It's because it fired at the beginning of the trial and the animal had to have to make a decision 20 seconds down the road. It's not, what did you say, Sidney, that the, the, the mouse says the rat has 20 million years prediction? This has, this has only 20 second prediction, but that time has to be gapped by somebody else. And the good news is that this neuron has many other partners, so this neuron fired later in the sequence, this neuron fired somewhere in between, and then very, very much later. Indeed, there is a sequential organization of the patterns. So, so what do we see now? What we see now is that in this n-dimensional space, uh, pack, the activity starts from somewhere, and where it starts and where it's going is determined by nothing else but the initial condition. If the initial conditions are the same, the trajectory will be the same, such as. Now what we do here is this is the same order of neurons. This is time again. Every line is a neuron. And we, we separated the trials according to the future turn of the animal, to the right or to the left. And it doesn't require a hell lot of statistics to see that I can look at the neurons at any slice of time along the, uh, across the journey here and predict where the animal is going. Because the initial conditions are different. In this case, if the initial conditions are the same, then we will inevitably end up in the same place. So the hippocampus can generate sequences in two fundamentally different ways. One is the way I showed you internally, but if the animal is running in an environment where the, up, where the hippocampus is, big, is updated by environmental cues, then indeed you can get this picture. But this is not the sole way how sequences can be generated. Now, we see the same slide again. Now, that I show you the movie here. So we, we can see the cell is active. Indeed, from this activity, we make this little map here. It's a tuning curve, if you want, or place map curve. But if you listen to this neuron more carefully, you will find that the, fires, the, the neuron fires rhythmically. The next trial will be even nicer. It's like a little drum. It fires at 8.7 hertz. And compared, this is the, the trial, 8.7 hertz, whereas the underlying activity, which is produced by many of these neurons that are doing exactly the same job, the, 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 the frequency is 8 hertz. Now we've got two oscillators that are different in frequency. They, result of two oscillators with different frequencies is interference. And of course, the fantastic thing about interference, it, it gives you absolute precision. Now, this is better than the mouse or the rat, because if you give me the phase today, I give you the phase of the moon in 20 million years. So indeed, it, it gives you a mechanism for prediction. Indeed, this is what, what Oki found that now we can take this, instead of looking at the entire event, we just look at the relationship between the phase of the theta cycle, when the animal is early in the journey, then it fires on the peak, and then it keeps going to the trough, and then it keeps going afterwards. So this is distance now, and this is the theta cycle shown three times, and you can see that is a relationship where the cell spikes in a small time window from which we can make a prediction where the animal is or where the animal will be in a short period of time. Now, the interesting thing is that this neuron was an oscillator. Every single pyramidal cell in the hippocampus that when fires reasonably, that is above uh, 10 hertz or so at the peak, it oscillates. And all of them oscillate faster, these are individual neurons, all of them oscillate faster than their mass product the joint product. Now this is very interesting. If you are a physicist in the room or engineers, figure out how to make an oscillator 
oscillating slower than the individual components that each of them oscillate faster. We solved that. If you're interested, you can read about it. But now let's go to if there is not one at a time, but there are five neurons. So in this case, there are five neurons. Uh, this is the tuning curve of each of these neurons. This is the relationship. These are the, each dot is a spike here corresponding to these colors. This is the theta cycle. This is distance. And you can see that there, are, there is this nice phase relationship or phase perception. But the good thing about it is that, that, that we can measure the relationship out there in the world, which is the representation inside the brain, by taking a ruler and said, what is the distance between representation of, uh, representation of neuron 1 and neuron 2? That is, when I go from here to here. So it takes about a few seconds for me to get from here to there. Uh, they are far apart. But how do I know, uh, how is it possible that they are organized in a, in a sequence? So the next thing we can do is to say, what is the organizer? How we can bring this neurons together that are firing apart into a biologically, or in membrane, membrane physics way, meaningful and, and codable. So what we can do the, the next time is to say, oh, we can ask this interesting question. Why are these tuning curves are so wide? You know, if the goal of the hippocampus is to represent each square inch of the environment as as uh, precisely as possible and to make a very good map, then of course it would be more advantageous to have a system like the, 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 the honeybee's retina where every neuron is, is tuned perfectly. Instead, what we see here is that they are very widely tuned. The advantage of this, of course, is that in any slice of time, many neurons fire together. So in this slice of time, which is, is going in this direction or any direction, we can look at the relationship between the future sequences of the representation out in the physical world, as well as the timing relationship between, of the, the, between the neurons. So blue neuron is right here. And the green neuron is firing about 10 millisecond cycle later in any given theta cycle. Then you can see that the next neuron is the red neuron. We can measure all the distances just like we do in a, in, a, in a mapping environment. We can also measure the temporal offsets within the theta cycle. We do it multiple times, and then we find a nice relationship. This relationship is sigmoid because only a certain segment of, time, of, of, of distances, or the certain segment of the world, can be coded into 100 millisecond. If an event is missing the theta cycle, and it enters in another theta cycle that's different. This relationship between distance and timing suggests that I can take a slice of, of, of theta, measure how far in time the neurons fire from each other, and I can predict what is the representation in the head of the animal for the future or for the past. But there is this limit. The limit is about 50 centimeters in the dorsal hippocampus of the rat. Anything beyond 50 centimeters and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and infinity is represented by pretty much the same way. The same thing applies, of course, to working mem or to, to the memory that I, we have, is we can recall something from the past with a clarity of, of, of with, a, with a span that is limited. You can, you can recall uh, the entire book and summarize it with very uh, causeway, or you can turn to a particular chapter, a particular page, or a particular l l paragraph, and every single time you jump there, you have this limitation how many items you can put in to bring it to working memory and, 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 uh, and, and, and percept your feeling. So I, I, I know what I said so far is incomprehensible, but <laughs> <laughs> let, let me try again with this, with this one. So, if the place fields would be identical, and there are these sequences in the simplest situation because the animal is walking with the same speed, then because of the, the t long tails in every single theta cycle, such as this one, the here and now is represented best by the yellow cell assembly. But the past representations also contribute a little, and the future representations are also contribute a little. And the animal has to travel for about 
a second or about 50 centimeters. So representation in this whole group has nothing to do with the rest. That is, the blues are running out and uh, they are here. It's just like the, the, what, what I presented you in the first five slides was very clear for a while, uh, but I'm now at this particular slide and uh, those slides have very little to do with what I'm saying now, except indirectly. So if you have a mechanism to present the past and the future, then you can determine the now. Now, the, the good thing about this is that, that in order to make the past and present and future separable, we need this very, very important mechanism that even in the 100 millisecond time scale, you have to separate neurons from each other. Cell assemblies should be separated in time. If they would be scrambled, then there would be some trouble, of course. So we have to understand is that what is the mechanism that provides these delays between assembly one and assembly two and why the lifetime of an assembly is such and not longer and not shorter. Of course, in this very complicated n-dimensional uh, system, such as the CA3, CA1 system, the, the, the traffic is just like this. To understand what controls them, we need some traffic lights, or we need some, uh, some, uh, some, some organization level. There is a whole family, an entire family of interneurons, and this is just showing the interneurons identified in the CA1 pyramid, uh, CA1 layer of the, 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 the brain, which is the most studied part of the brain. And there are, according to Peter Schumer, 20 different type of traffic controllers whose job is nothing else just to control how the traffic in the pyramidal cells are moving. I think it's fair to say that we know close to nothing how these neurons are wired to each other. And our knowledge how these neurons are wired to the pyramidal cells is also very minimal. No wonder is the way how we talk about all this is th this is the level of our understanding. <laughs> so what can we do? Well, I didn't tell you about the, the, the methods that I'm using or we are using to understand and record from, uh, from a large number of neurons. Uh, this is the state of the art today, but there is absolutely no reason why, this is the tip of this electrode, why we cannot monitor every single neuron along this area. So instead of recording from 100 or so, we should be able to record simultaneously from many, many, many neurons. This is a solvable issue. There is, the technology is available. Uh, it, it just requires some effort. In order to, uh, this would be the first step, of course, is to segregate. It would be like, like, like uh, in a code, you would say this is exact, this is one component, this is another component, this is another component, this is another component. Now, when we have this, we have to group them somehow. So oh, these are capacitors, these are resistors, these are transistors, and so on. So we have to identify these neurons. And now, of course, we have to turn to the mouse, and this is what I, we heard in the, from, from, from David and also from Ed. And uh, one of the traffic controllers is uh, a famous parvovomin containing interneuron that, that targets and hugs the somata of the pyramidal cells. So taking advantage of the, 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 the PV Cree mouse with adeno-associated virus, you can label these neurons and making them photosensitive, uh, and the, the, all this anatomical and molecular biological work was done in Jeff McGee's lab. So once we have this tool, then what we can do is put in the, the silicon probes that I just showed you, record simultaneously neurons, and activate preferably only those neurons that you are recording from simultaneously. And uh, in fact, if you use the right, right uh, 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 color of light, then you can activate these cells fairly specifically. What are we testing? Well, one of the things to, to test, of course, is do they do at all anything? This is, in, in, is at a very small volume, so we turn off probably no more than five, eight parvobin containing neurons in the hippocampus at a time. The, the test or the hypothesis that we are examining is what allows the distribution of these assemblies in a given theta cycle. So I just give you the bottom line. This is a control situation. Several neurons are recorded uh, simultaneously. They are very beautifully and evenly spaced within the theta cycle. 
on alternate trials, we turn on the light. On other trials, we don't have the trials, so this is a perfect control. The animal is running on, a, on, a, on an environment. This is a freely moving, freely behaving animal. And what you can see here is that when you block these traffic controllers, the, the, the somatic inhibitory interneurons, then all the activity goes to the trough. So instead of this very nice separation within the theta phase that represents the past, the present, and the future, they, are, they get scrambled, making it difficult to identify the here and now. So what I like to summarize what I just said, that indeed one of the reasons why many of us are in this business because we believe that the algorithms that have been worked out for something useful are very conservative. They don't change very much, so we can apply our knowledge from here to here. And the, the interesting thing, of course, is that the neocortex grows enormously, so the information in the hippocampus gets very different. But its algorithm doesn't change very much. So just to repeat what I said at the beginning, uh, the, this, this algorithm that have been probably worked out initially to measure distances in the real world and allow the animal to navigate in real space is probably the same as the navigating system in our cognition that allows us, that is, to travel from anywhere to anywhere in the neocortex. Uh, the, the metric that is associated with this, the hippocampal theta cycle, it's an oscillation. There is probably a proper readout mechanism that I haven't talked about yet. And without inhibition, there is no order in the brain. No cell sequences, no, no, no uh, segregation, or anything like this would happen. So what is, what is my wish list? Uh, my wish list is very simple. I'm just reiterating what the previous <laughs> speaker said. Basically, we need to identify circuits my way. That is not just making beautiful color uh, maps that are lots of neurons from, from here to there, we would like to know how each component is connected in the, in the system. If you just say generally that, oh, oh uh, PNP transistors, uh, the collector is usually going to the positive uh, 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 power, that's not enough. We have to say for every single component how they are embedded into the uh, situation. And for this, there is no shortcut. We have to do single cell reconstructions and with their partners. The other one I think is, uh, is uh, pretty feasible. It's, a, it's an issue of money, uh, at least this part. And, uh, and Ed Boydan is working on, on this as well, uh, or working especially much on this, how we can make probes that deliver light locally and probably multiple lights and everything. And my last wish would be, of course, is this. You know, the, I don't know how this whole thing started. <laughs> I, I know money and time and all these things. But when, when there's a goal to understand is how the brain works, this is a very good preparation. We've got enormous amount of knowledge on the behavior of the rat, the physiology of the rat, anatomy of the rat, and so on. So I think instead of us being forced to downscale everything to this level, I would like you to do this for us in the same way how we can do it in the mouse. Thanks a lot.